Hello and welcome to week one of Computer Science 225. This week we have two main goals. First, we're going to talk about the Unix family of operating systems and command line systems in general, talking about some of the advantages and reasons to learn to use command line systems and Unix itself. Then our second main goal for this week is to make sure that you can log in to the computer science uh, department server that we have. Logging into the system, which is the, the CompSci server or CPSC at umw.edu. Logging into the system will allow you to follow, on, follow along with the class for each week, uh, trying out the material that we're doing, as well as doing the hands-on assignments. So first, we'll talk about the Unix family of operating systems. So Unix was a operating system that was developed first in the 1970s at AT&T Bell Labs, which is the same group that created the C and C++ programming languages, which were extremely influential and are the basis for Java and JavaScript and PHP and many other languages. This group uh, created C and Unix basically at the same time. The Unix operating system was extremely uh, extremely influential. It was the first really modern operating system that supported multiple users and things like this. And so Unix has uh, been basically copied by lots of other operating systems. Um, some of the operating systems in the Unix family include Linux, which is the one that we're going to be using for this class. Linux is also used by basically every supercomputer. Um, the good majority of web servers run Linux. It's also um, behind Chrome OS and Android, which is are, are used in most uh, phones and tablets. It's also used um, Linuxes uh, behind the Valve Steam Deck and things like that. Um, so Linux is really, really widely used in lots of different areas. Um, another Unix family operating system is the iOS and OS X operating systems from Apple that are behind Apple computers and iP iPods and iPads and things like that. Um, other uh, operating systems in the uh, Unix family include BSD, which is, is not as widely used. Um, pretty much the only modern operating system that isn't a Unix operating system is Microsoft Windows. But luckily there's things like the Windows subsystem for Linux that also let you do Unix things on top of Windows. It's basically a, a compatibility layer. So um, the reason for uh, me telling you all this is so that you know that pretty much everything that you're going to learn in this class is applicable to pretty much every operating system you'll use. Um, the, uh, reason that this is important is because the commands that you're using, uh, you're going to be learning in this class, can be done on any Unix-based operating system, which includes all Linux and OS X systems, as well as Windows if you have the um, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. So even though these systems have very different interfaces and look quite different, they share sort of the same underlying features and commands and the way they work as, as each other. And what you'll learn in this class can therefore be applied to, to all of them with pretty much no changes. So now let's take a look at a command line and see what it actually looks like. So here we have a Linux terminal window open. And unlike a graphical user interface, there aren't any menus or buttons or things to really click on. The command line interface is completely textual. So there's a few things that you can look at. First of all, we have this um, bit of text over here on the left. This is called the prompt. We'll uh, look at all of the different parts of this uh, later on in the class and learn how to customize it. But by default, it shows your username, which for me is iFinlay. Then it shows the machine that you're logged into, which in this case is the CPSC server, which is just shown as CPSC. Then we have our current directory, which is represented by this tilde, which we'll talk about next week. And then typically the prompts end in a dollar sign. So the way the command line systems work is that you give the system commands one by one by typing them in. And then the system reacts to your command by carrying it out, whatever it was that you told it to do. So just as a quick example, I can make a directory by using the mkdir command. We'll learn about all these commands and more over the coming weeks, but this is just to sort of give you a flavor of what the command line system is and how it looks and how it works. So for instance, I can make a directory called project one by giving it the command mkdir project one. 
Another useful command is the cd command, which is standing for change directory. This will change us into the project one directory. And then you can see that the prompt has changed and no longer does it just say tilde, but it says tilde slash, slash project one. One of the important things that we're going to have to learn in this class is how to sort of be aware of where in the system you are based off of the prompt and also the cd commands that you give it. It's not really uh, as hard as it might seem right now. Another useful command that we can do is the date command, which will give us the date and time that it is currently. And as you can see, we are uh, at the time of shooting this video on January 5th, 2023, which is a Thursday. So this is the way that the command line system works. You give it commands. it does some change to the system or produces some information and shows it to you, and then you give it another command. This um, is the basis for command line systems and how they work. You sort of iteratively give the system commands, which it then carries out. Over the course of the semester, we're going to learn how to do this. We're going to learn how do you keep track of where in the file system you are, what commands exist, what do they do, how to use them, all of those kinds of things. But for now, we're just sort of talking in general terms. And so the first probably question to address is why use the command line system? Why not just stick with windows, with drop down menus and buttons and checkboxes and all those kinds of things? Well, there's a few important reasons um, which I'll lay out. The first is that uh, all of those different Unix based systems that I talked about, for example, Android and OS X and uh, regular Linux, um, and Windows with the Windows subsystem for Linux and BSD, all of them look incredibly different in terms of their graphical user interface. And if you learn how to use one, it doesn't necessarily help you at all in terms of using another one. But the command line interfaces for all of those systems is pretty much identical. So if you learn how to use the command line effectively on one system, you can transition to any other system and use things pretty much exactly the same way that you're used to. Um, the Linux command line, the Unix command line rather, is really ubiquitous. Another reason is that not only does the command line stay the same as you move between different systems, but it also stays the same as you move forward in time. If you used Windows in the 90s, at, like I did, and then also tried to use Windows now, you'll see that the interface is completely different and they've moved things around to a tremendous degree. Um, but the uh, command line system between Linux in the 90s and Linux now or Linux in the 90s and OS X now is basically the same. The commands that I learned when I was in college work exactly the same way as they do now. Sometimes commands get new features, um, new uh, options and new flags and things like that, but they never take things away and things stay backwards compatible to really a remarkable degree. The early Unix uh, operating systems developed in the 1970s still, you know, carry the same commands and the basic system is exactly the same up to the current day. You don't have to keep relearning how things work or refining things like that. Another big advantage of using the command line is using it for remote access to a system. So if you're working on a website, that website isn't going to be running on your own computer. It's not gonna run on your own laptop or your own desktop computer. It's going to be running on a web server somewhere else, maybe in a different part of the country or a different country entirely. And so if you need to go on to that web server to make some changes or do some profiling or monitoring, it's much, much easier to do that over the command line than it is using a graphical user interface. The nice thing about command line systems is that you can enter commands on your own current computer, or you can log in remotely to a computer on the other side of the world and access it exactly the same way. So having that remote access is really, um, really a huge thing. I've also done things with um, little, you know, like embedded systems and things like that, that sometimes don't have graphical displays at all. And so you can log into those systems remotely as well, even though it's sitting right on your desk. It's a, a thing that you can do with the Unix command line that you can't really easily do with any sort of graphical system. Another advantage is that using the command line system is usually more efficient than using a graphical user interface. I can enter a command 
much faster than I can click through menu options and use a window dialog and things like that. There are some things that are easier to do with a mouse, but usually most people are a lot faster typing things out than they are clicking around the screen. So it's not usually a big difference, but over the course of many years using a computer system, learning how to do things a little bit more efficiently is really worth it. And this becomes even more important when we start talking about scripts, which we'll talk about later in this semester. In most graphical user interfaces, there's not a way to automate things automatically. You can't sort of like uh, tell the computer to click on this menu and then select this thing and then copy and paste this and put it somewhere else and things like that, things that you have to click around with the mouse for, you can't easily automate them by having them sort of work all at once automatically. On the other hand, the command line text-based system that we're going to learn in this class is really, really amenable to scripting. Anything that you can put in a command and execute, you can also put in something called a script, which is basically a little program that contains commands. And this is such a huge boon for productivity. You can take things that would otherwise have to manually be done and put them in a script to sort of happen automatically all at once. And so for all these reasons, it's really worth it to learn how to use the command line system. It'll make you a lot more efficient and let you access systems that otherwise you wouldn't really be able to deal with. So now we're going to talk about how we actually connect to the CPSC server. So we're going to do this using a system called SSH. First of all, SSH stands for Secure Shell. This is going to be the system that lets us go from our own local computer onto the CPSC server. So the way this works is you're going to connect with SSH onto the CPSC server. Um, when you do that, the commands that you enter into your laptop or your own personal computer aren't going to be executed by your own computer. They're going to be sent across the network over the internet to the cpsc.umw.edu server, which isn't located um, in the same room as you, of course. You're communicating with it over the network. Then the CPSC server is going to take those commands and interpret them and take some action. For instance, if you do the mkdir command we saw earlier, it's going to create a new directory on the file system. If you give it the date command, it's going to figure out what day and time it is and send that information back across to you. So the results of the commands that you run, any output from them is going to be sent back to your local computer and you go back and forth like this as many times as it takes until you are done and log out of the system again. So you should have received from the computer science server system an email with your username and password for this system. Your username is your regular UMW net ID, that's your regular UMW username, and your password is randomly generated by the system and sent to you in an email to your UMW email address. If you can't find this email or have lost it or forgotten your password, please just email me and I'll reset your password on the system. Now, when you um, have your username and password, you'll need to log into the system. The way that works is slightly different depending on if you're using a Unix system such as Linux or Mac or a Windows system. So if you come to the notes down here below this uh, video for week one, you'll see two different um, links. One is for Windows and one is for OS X or Linux. This video won't take you through the instructions on Windows. You can go through this page and follow along with the instructions to get logged in. Um, I don't easily have a Windows computer to show you how to do this on a video. But with OS X or Linux, it's actually a little bit easier. So what you'll do for a Linux or Mac computer is to log in something like this. Um, here we have, I have a um, terminal window open just on my local computer, which is running Linux. So if you're running Mac, you can open a terminal by searching your applications for terminal, I believe. And then this terminal that I have right here is a little bit different than the last one we saw because here I'm on my local computer, which isn't called CPSC, it's just called Magrathea. Um, I use the same username on this system as I do on CPSC. Yours is probably different if you're using a Mac computer or a Linux computer. Um, your username is probably different than your UMW net ID, but that's okay. To log in, 
with SSH into the CPSC server. We do the SSH command followed by your username on that computer, which is your net ID, followed by cpsc.umw.edu. Then you will be logged onto the system and you should see something like this. This is sort of the generic welcome message that the system is going to give us every time we log in. Now there are two ways to log in over SSH. The first one is to use your password. This is the default thing that's going to happen when you log on to the CPSC server for the first time. It will ask you to type your password in. Now, something that's confusing about this is that when you type your password into these systems, it's not going to show you stars or dots or anything like that. It is not going to look like it's reading your password at all. Um, and this throws a lot of people off because they're used to seeing the little dots appear when you enter a password or little asterisks or something like that. But just know that even though it doesn't look like it's accepting your password, it actually is. Just type it in and hit enter and you should be logged in. That's the first way to log in over SSH using your password. The second way is using something called um, SSH keys, which is the way that I have it working, which is why when you saw me log in a second ago, it didn't actually ask me for a password. It just logged in directly. Now, this, um, these sets of instructions that I have on the notes page right here show you how to log in with the SSH keys as well. So for Windows, um, sort of the first little sets of instructions right here will guide you through logging in and changing your password. And then the second set of instructions right here will show you how to set up the SSH keys so you can log in without your password. And same thing for the OSX or Linux instructions. The first sets of instructions are just to log in and change your password. And then the second set right here is for doing it with keys so that you don't have to log in with your password. Um, the nice thing about logging in with SSH keys is that obviously it's a little bit easier because you don't have to type in your password every time. And also it's really very secure as well because basically the way that SSH keys work is it generates like a super long random password for you and uses that to log in um, essentially instead. So please take a moment now to make sure that you can log into the system. Make sure that you can um, find the email that you've been sent with your username and password and follow the instructions, either the Windows instructions or the Linux or OS X instructions based off of what type of computer you have yourself to make sure you can log into the CPSC server. Also, if you would, um, I do recommend setting up the SSH keys as well. Even though it's optional, it's kind of nice not to have to type your password every single time you log in. One other thing I should note about the SSH keys is that it um, is only between sort of one pair of machines. So if we come back and look at this diagram, if your local laptop, if you set it up with the SSH keys, the way that it'll basically work is you'll have what's called a private key set up on your own computer and then the public key set up on the cpsc.umw.edu server. And that allows you to connect from this machine without typing up your password. If you then, for whatever reason, connect with a different machine, for instance, um, if you go to the computer lab here on campus and connect um, from that machine onto the CPSC server, it'll make you enter your password again. The keys only sort of work between one pair of machines. Just as importantly, you need to keep that private key on your local computer safe and not accidentally share it with somebody because otherwise they'll be able to log onto the server with your name um, and do things with your account and so on. So if you do set up the private key and public key pair, make sure that you keep the private key part safe. All right, so hopefully now you are able to log in to the CPSC server. If you have any trouble with that, if you can't find the username and password email that you've been sent, or if you forgot your password or something like that, or if you need help setting up the SSH keys, please just send me an email or come by office hours so that we can get that figured out. Then hopefully when you have uh, the ability to log into the system, we can talk a little bit about the structure of the commands and sort of how they work. All right, the very first thing to emphasize again is that when I did this SSH command to begin with, I was on my local machine, which I've named Magrathea. Whereas now that I'm logged into the CPSC server, the commands that I enter, they don't affect the computer that I have sitting on the desk in front of me. And for you, they won't affect your laptop or your um, 
desktop computer or whatever you're actually typing the commands into. Instead, they're sent over the internet through SSH to the CPS server, CPSC server, and that is the computer that they actually take effect on. Okay, so then I can enter commands and see the effect that they have. For instance, I can execute the command cal, which is short for calendar, and that gives you a handy little calendar displayed. It's not often terribly useful, but sometimes on the command line, you just want to know like what day a particular date is or something like that, and the cal command can give you that info. So today, as we can see from our login time, um, is actually the 5th of January, which is a Thursday. Now, some commands like this, like cal, you can just give the command just by itself. Just saying cal will tell the cal command to give you back the calendar for the current month. But the cal command can actually take what's called arguments as well. And so arguments are things that you give to the command after the name of the command. Just like when you call a function in Python or Java, when you call a method, you can sometimes give them parameters which change the way that they work. And so here we're passing the command cal in argument, which is the number 2022. Um, actually, it's 2023 now, so let me pass that instead. And when we do this, it changes the way the command works. When you pass a number to the cal command, what it does is it causes it to print out the entire year's calendar instead of just our current month. And so here we can see we are on Thursday the 5th, but we can also look and see, for instance, what day um, of the week um, New Year's Eve is going to be, which is going to be a Sunday this year. Cal can also take multiple arguments. So if we give it 10 2023, it will show us just the month 10, which is October, of the year 2023. So if we want to look for a specific month and year, we can give Cal these two arguments instead. Many commands in the Unix system work like this, where you can just give it the um, name of the command to get sort of a default thing to happen, whereas you can pass arguments to sort of customize or change what happens to some degree. Cal is kind of a remarkable program in some ways because it tells you many, many years ahead of time what day things will be. So if you wanted to know for the year 3000 that uh, what day of the week February 1st would be, it will tell you. I found it to be incredibly accurate in its calendar output. Um, there's one sort of interesting thing about Cal, uh, or rather about the history of the Western calendar, which is that if we give Cal 9 and 1752 as its two arguments, it shows us one of the weirdest months it has to be in the history of the world in terms of the way the calendar was kept because in this month, you can see that it goes from the 2nd of September all the way to the 14th of September. The reason for this weird skip is that uh, England at the time in the 1700s sort of fell out of step with the rest of the world based on the way they were calculating leap years and sort of had to catch up with the rest of Europe by adopting the Georgian calendar. And so they had to cut out several days from the month of September. Just a little historical side note there. But uh, suffice to say, Cal is kind of a neat program if you want to play around with when things happened. So Cal takes, as we've said, these arguments like 9 and 1752. Cal also takes what are called options. And to see an example of an option, we can try to print out just the month of the current year. So like, let's say we just want to print March. If I do Cal 3, well, that prints us the year three, which is probably not what we want unless we're doing some sort of historical research, I guess. What we probably want is just to have the month three. So instead, we can do cal-m3. And what the dash m is, is it's an option. So there's arguments, which are things that start without a hyphen, like just three or nine and 1752. Or there's also options that start with a hyphen. So hyphen M is an option telling us to use the month of whatever comes next. So in this case, it gives us the third month defaulting to the current year. As another little example, we can give it cal-a1, which says to print one month after the current month. And we can also give it dash b1, which says to print one month before the current month. So the dash a option and the dash b option both take these arguments with the numbers that tell it how many months both before and after the current month to print. So that way, if it's, for example, the first, we can see, oh, okay, when was the 31st and so on. We won't end up using the Cal program very often. Um, 
I do sometimes from time to time check it, but it's not that helpful. I just sort of wanted to give an example of a command and talk about options and arguments which are going to be important in lots of the commands that we use. Another thing that I would like to talk about that's really important is that when you hit the up arrow on the keyboard when you're connected to a terminal like this, you cycle back through the previous commands that you've dealt with. So when you hit the up arrow, you return back to the previous commands that you have seen. And when you hit the down arrow, you go back to the newer commands that you've typed. This is gonna be important as we get into typing longer commands because you don't wanna to have to go and type them again. You just can hit the up arrow to get back to the previous ones that you've seen. Another really important thing to keep in mind on the command line is that you don't generally have to type the entire command. For instance, um, you saw that I typed this clear command, which is one that just brings you back to a clear terminal. It just sort of erases the screen and goes back to the top. If we wanted to type this, we can hit CL and hit tab, and then it will give you a list of all the commands that start with um, CL. And if you hit CLE and hit tab, it will bring you to the command clear. So you can just hit CLE tab, and then that will complete the rest of it. This is called tab completion, and it's gonna be even more handy for completing the names of files, which we'll get to when we start talking about files and directories. But I just want to have you keep these things in mind that you can cycle back through the previous and uh, more recent commands that you've typed, and also that there's this thing called tab completion, where you can type just the start of something and hit tab, and it will automatically complete the rest of it, sort of like auto-complete. So those two things make it so that there's less typing involved, because otherwise we would have to type a lot of things that otherwise really could be automated. So that's all for this week. The super important thing that we did was get set up with logging into the CPSC server. That's going to be crucial to be able to follow along with the semester, to do the assignments, and to try out the commands in the weeks as we learn them and start learning how to use these tools. So definitely make sure that you can log on to the CPSC system. Again, I want to emphasize that if you can't, now is the time to figure out any issues with that and let me know, come to office hours, send me an email if something isn't working right. Um, the other thing that we did today was sort of talking about how SSH works, um, how we can connect to a system that, work, that is you know, not right in front of us. Uh, we talked about sort of the benefits of using the command line system and the different Unix-based operating systems that we're going to be able to use these tools on. So next week, we're going to start learning some more useful commands past just cal and clear, which are admittedly of limited use. Next week, we're going to start learning commands for dealing with files and directories. How do we make files and make directories and navigate where we are, um, copy things, move things, things like that, um, that are going to be really just sort of the bread of butter of using a command line system like this. So that's what we're talking about next week. I'll see you then. Thanks.